Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. It is my honor to convene this daily conversation around all aspects of the COVID-19 crisis, but we're actually covering three specific crises, the health, financial, and racial inequality crises. We're always looking for guests and theme suggestions. Please email us, sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E at S-R-E-E dot net. Everyone, please tag your friends. Please hit share right now. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Today, we have a very special guest, my friend Mei Fong, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and director of strategy at the Center for Public Integrity. She's also the author of One Child, the story of China's most radical experiment. You will learn so much from her today as I have every day that I have known her almost now for 20 years, maybe more than 20 years, we'll have to do some math. Everyone, please hit share right now. We're gonna get started in just a minute and you will meet her, hi everybody. I'm Sri Srinivasan. Thank you for being here. We are on episode 108. That means we've been on lockdown in New York for 108 days. We've had 108 shows in 108 days because of all of you. So many of you have written in and told us how helpful you found this show. You said it's useful. Some One of you called it a lifeline. And I say to you that it is my lifeline. This has been helpful for me. I am grateful to everyone who's watched. We wanna show you some statistics to see the full picture of this show. We've had more than a million viewers and 60 million social impressions in the first 100 shows. We've had 201 guest speakers from 45 cities in 12 countries and had 124 of them were women. And we're very proud of that number that comes from the intentionality of the work we're doing. We've had doctors, nurses, authors, journalists, CEOs, founders, teachers, professors, and so many other professions. And we are able to do this because of our partnership with Scroll.in, one of India's best news and culture and analysis websites. We're always looking for sponsors and guest ideas, so please email us, sri at sri.net. Please make sure that you share this right now. We would love to hear where you're watching from. We are live on all these platforms, but we wanna know where you're watching from. We do something that we call our global tour, where we ask everyone to tell us where they're watching from and we visit and talk about the various places you're watching from. So just tap in and tell us where you're watching from right now. First, let's thank our sponsors for making all of this possible. We're grateful to Rutgers Global Entrepreneurship Experience, a virtual teen camp if you have a teenager, they can attend July 13th to 17th and July 20th to 24th, two identical camps. You get 20% off the code SREE. Go to globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org, globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org, and they'll learn from speakers from Cognizant, Google, Facebook, Angie's List, and so many other great companies, fantastic speakers, will be present at globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org. We also wanna thank Muckrack Academy and the Fundamentals of Social Media, a free course now available, certification course, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. Anybody can attend, everybody will benefit from this. More than 4,000 people have already signed up, mrac.co slash social. Please make sure you sign up Take a picture, take a screenshot, share it with your friends. And finally, we want to thank our friends at She's On Call. This is a brand new show that airs every Sunday. These are the guests from last Sunday, Dr. Nadia Hernandez and Dr. Lilun Lee. Our hosts are Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean, two fabulous surgeons in New York City, and they host this show every single Sunday. Make sure you follow at She's On Call, so you can watch on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Hashtag She's On Call. 
Are you all ready to meet, meet, meet Mei Fong? Let's remind you of our guest for today. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the Director of Strategy at the Center for Public Integrity. We're gonna have a wide ranging conversation about all kinds of topics and lots of things around COVID-19 and this moment we're in. So please welcome Mei Fong. Hi, Mei. Hey, Sri, how are you? Uh, let's see. Hey, I'm good. We, we're, uh, let's, uh, let's see, we're, the first question I ask all our guests, how are you doing and where are you? Well, um, I am in the outskirts of DC um, in my house. I've just put the kids to bed. And um, I don't know if you've ever had the distinction of having a guest in her nightgown, but <laughs> I am in my pajamas right now. <laughs> That's awesome. We can't tell. And you remember when there was that one BBC interviewee who had his kid walk in and that was like a worldwide phenomenon. Everybody laughed. Today, it's not a regular Zoom interview if you don't have your kid in the show or something goes, something like that happens, isn't it? I, I have them all prepped out, but they're not as cute. I'm like, come in there, look cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're, you're, uh, how are you doing through this crisis? Uh, how's your family? We, we always ask that question. Well, it's really interesting. You mentioned this is 108 days since lockdown. I haven't counted, but um, wow. Well, um, it's hard to maintain sanity, uh, but um, well, my consolation is it's an honor to be on your show at the 108 show because for Chinese, 108 is a lucky number. Yet Ling Fat is, 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 it sounds pretty good. It's a good number. <laughs> so let's hope that, um, that take that as a sign of optimism for what's coming ahead. Yeah, and you remember that, uh, and you taught me that the Olympics that China put on in Beijing was very specifically on a particular date that they launched. Remind us of that. August 8, 2008. Um, so for Chinese people, eight is a very good number. It's a lucky number. So for when China decided they wanted to host the Olympic, the very first one, they very specifically wanted this day, this day, because of that special number. Yeah. And that's how they got eight eight oh eight. And you were and you were in Beijing at the time. Yeah, I was in the, 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 the stadium at the time. And you know, August it, it's the worst time of the year in Beijing. It's really hot. They actually had to make rain because it was so dry and so polluted. Uh, and they closed all the factories down just all ahead of time. So it was very Orwellian. And they and if any if anybody can make it rain, it's China, right? They were able to make that happen. Yep, they, they send, um, you know, planes in the air shooting uh, silver uh, di uh, dioxide to in the clouds to cause a concentrated rain. So they actually have a, a, a weather modification bureau. That's what it's called. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's just an example of the kinds of uh, interventions that they can do at scale because of the size of the country, because of their technology, and also because they have full say, right? It's uh, they, when the government is all powerful, they can do all powerful things. But that was then, and it sounds almost quaint. I mean, if you talk about today, and we're talking about COVID, right? The level of surveillance and control um you know that china has this unsurpassed anywhere in the world um so you know you want to go somewhere you're going to have your your phone and it's got to have the right zone otherwise you can't go there you have to click you have to take pictures of your temperature and, and send it off and, and you know any number of things they know where you go they know what you spent your money on everything can be monitored so everything that can be monitored will be monitored, right? That's another. And, and of course, during COVID, you know, um, a lot of people agreed to give up more of these, um, you know, to be surveilled in this matter because it was a public health issue. The concern now, of course, is that after this public health issue passes, uh, the government will still be able to keep tabs on you in all sorts of ways and manners. Well, let's uh, take a look at your Twitter feed. I, I know there's a good way to introduce uh, you to our, our to, to introduce you to our audience. It, it's, you say journalist, writer, director of strategy at Public Integrity, Pulitzer Prize winner, author of hashtag One Child, and former Wall Street Journal reporter. And you've got your LinkedIn there as well. Let's start with talking about your uh, your work as uh, first of all. Let's tell everybody your Twitter handle. It's Mei Fong 
writer and tell us what TEDx you're speaking at on this photo. Um, I would at the TEDx Pasadena talking about my book, One Child, which is all about the one child uh, policy in China and um, how it came about and what are the costs and consequences of that. You know. And tell us about the Center for Public Integrity. Yeah, um, the Center for Public Integrity is one of America's oldest uh, Pulitzer winning nonprofit newsrooms. So it's been around for about 30 years. We specialize in doing deep dive, very data driven, um, you know, investigative journalism. Um, we, we never met a Freedom of Information Act we didn't like. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time looking at the intersection between government policy and power and privilege. So for example, we just last week um, sued the Small Business Association for uh, information on the paycheck protection loan, you know, where billions of dollars been given to small businesses and initially they said that they weren't going to disclose what some of these businesses, uh, who these businesses were, uh, but under public pressure now they sort of said they will, but we're still suing them because we wanna get all the full information out. This is taxpayer dollars. And as we know, uh, some of the businesses that did get millions of dollars were not small businesses at all, you know, like Shake Shack, uh, Potbelly and a couple of other places. So, it's really worth knowing where the money went, who got it, and these are taxpayer dollars. And tell us uh, about the, the slogan that you're, you, you have, keeping them honest. We report for you, so they report to you. Tell us about that. Yeah, right. So we are in D.C., so the idea is, you know, the business of government uh, basically affects all everybody in America. So, uh, and some of this stuff can seem really arcane and, dull, but you know, that really directly affects, um, you know, what happens in your, your hometown, your state, you know, education policy, uh, public health, clearly now we know this. So the idea is, you know, behind that slogan is, you know, we, you know, we keep an eye on them so that we can, and we report to you because we are, we, we are, we, we, we are in service of the public. So that's what we do. Um, so these are the kinds of things we do. So for example, one of the big things we did was uh, last year was we built this data tracker that looks at all the special bills that are put forth in state houses. So the idea is, okay, so in DC, there's quite a lot of media paying attention to what goes on in the White House. But in all the state houses across America, there's a lot less attention, especially now because so many media organizations, so many local newsrooms had to close down. It, you're, you're lucky maybe if you you have someone covering city hall and, and but then maybe in some cases it's one person or two you know covering everything now so um one of the things we discovered was you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of rules and state uh, that get, get passed in state houses that are actually pushed by special interest groups and lobbyists and they're kind of copycat bills they they get submitted and they're actually the same bills. They're, they're pushed by, say, the uh, tobacco industry or something. And, you know, everywhere from uh, Juneau in Alaska to, um, to uh, you know, um, Alabama to everywhere else. And, you, and people in um, Alaska may not know um, that the same bill is being pushed in Alabama. But because we built a data tracker that scans some of these thousands of bills, we discover similar language. We put the shoe leather reporting into it. And the upshot is you discover that quite a lot of these uh, laws that are being passed across America are very similar laws that really significantly weaken, say, your religious protection or auto safety. There was this bill we discovered that had been pushed by uh, the auto industry uh, that enables the sale of defective cars. So that was something we did. And that was something that we won uh, with, in collaboration with USA Today and Arizona Republic. And that was something that we won the Goldsmith Award for, which is one of the biggest prizes in journalism given by Harvard's Shorenstein Center. So that's the kind of journalism that we do. And it's expensive to do because deep dives, building data trackers, all these things are kind of uh, difficult to do. And so for-profit media organizations, unless they're the really big ones, may not have that space or the capacity or, and it's not sexy, you know, the way that you, you're doing some, you know, celebrity stories, for example, uh, but that's the kind of stuff that we do. So it's nerdy, but fun.
like that nerdy but fun is a great way to think about this. <laughs> We're also looking at your CEO's uh, article uh, here. Tell us about this. Oh yeah, so my CEO, Susan Smith Richardson, um, is a longtime veteran covering, um, you know, police issues, um, issues regarding race equality. She is also our first African American CEO that the center has had, and so her analysis is basically looking at how you know when when George Floyd's protests exploded. Uh, we knew very much a lot of it is tied to the inequality issue, which is one of the things that we spend a lot of time looking at the center because this is one of the biggest problems that America has right now. We are a very unequal society. We are the most unequal we've been in half half a century. So we are in a new gilded age. Um, what does that mean? That means that um, the top one percent, you know, owns a, a significant chunk of wealth, and a lot of us down below uh, don't have the necessary equal opportunities to get up there. You know, there are all these barriers in, in, in education and health and so on that prevent these from happening. And that's all kind of basically exploded with COVID-19, right? You see that, um, it's, you know, COVID-19 was not an equal opportunity disease at all. We saw that it affected, um, you know, um, Hispanics and Blacks um, much more we saw that it um, it has a much more the, the shutdown, for example, has significantly impacted women much more than men in, in many ways. Um, um, jobless unemployment rates um, for Latinx is the highest um, for women, especially also. So these were all sort of issues that we look at, um, at to, to to the inequality lens. Because that is one of the biggest problems that we have now in America. And I was just scrolling through your uh, colleagues, so we want to give a shout out to the team. Um, yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot of people there. <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, so we are, um, we, there are about, we're a small newsroom, we're under 50, so we're not huge. Um, and full disclosure, we did actually apply for the PPP loan too, and we said so, uh, because we are really a small business. We are not a Shake Shack in any way. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Shake Shacks, can, if Shake Shack can apply, then so can, certainly so can you. And that was one of the very, confusing many many confusing things about this crisis folks if you're just joining us we are talking to may fong a pulitzer prize winning journalist and we're just delighted to have her here we're going to answer your questions she's going to take your questions and also we're going to take your comments right now may we do this thing that we call a global tour as people tell us where they're watching and we'd love for you to respond uh, including if you know any of these people and also if you've been to any of the places uh, that they're watching from. Also, many memories of favorite foods, things like that. And I hope you had a chance to share on your Twitter and on your Facebook, because I, I don't want your friends and family to miss this. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's go to the global tour. So yes, so we're starting in Maine with Danielle Flood. Hey, Danielle, how are you? Um, I have been to Maine, totally love the lobster uh, and the butter <laughs> and the beautiful views and Stephen King, who is a native of Maine and writes quite a lot about it. <laughs> and, and by the way, if you go to Bangor, I don't know if you made it there, you, you can, on, on Google Maps, there's Stephen King's house, and you can go and stand outside and take pictures. And Halloween, he comes out with his wife and gives candy out and also watches movies in his hometown theater. So uh, you're right about Stephen King. Jonathan's watching from Earth, from Union Square. Hey, I don't know which Union Square are we talking about. Oh, the New York about? City Union, New, New York City. Yep. Hey, hey, Jonathan. Yes, Union Square. Mm, that's a yep. good place to with my husband. <laughs> uh, Jonathan has watched 108 straight episodes, and we had him as a guest on our hundred and on our hundredth episode as a thank you for being with us. And he was here with uh, with so many terrific guests who were here that day, and we all learned something. Uh, including the W.E. Du Bois professor at Cornell, Nollyway Rooks, Brandy Harden, a lawyer and board member of Justice Aid, Reverend Kenny Irby, and Jonathan Borstein. We had other guests as well. These were just the people we could fit in that card that day for our 100th episode. So let's keep going around the world and see who else is here. Radian's watching from Center Reach, Long Island, and Paula Kiger's watching from Tallahassee, Florida, and Paula is a member of our team. Uh, she's part of our New York Times read-along, and you have been a guest on that read-along show. 
which we loved having you. And she is uh, in Tallahassee, Florida. Have you been? I have not been to Tallahassee, Florida, uh, but hi, Paula. Um, I actually just did help arrange a virtual funeral for a friend um, in Florida. Uh, that just happened. He lived in New York. He died of COVID-19. Um, his family flew his ashes back to Florida, and we helped arrange a, a Zoom memorial service for it, which was the first one I've ever did. So, yeah. And, and it was very moving. You, you all did a great job. And uh, he had organized, I remember, a wonderful uh, party for you when you and your husband, Andrew, our friend, my friend, Andrew, uh, came to visit America when you were living overseas. And uh, he was such a fun, loving um, guy. And to have died, you know, in his early 50s tells you that this is now we know, of course, now it's obvious that it's affecting young people. But when he died, he was on the younger side of people who were dying and uh, uh, and, and really tragic. Uh, Rehani is watching from Morocco. Have you been? I have not been to Morocco. I would love to go. <laughs> so yeah. our families travel a lot together, so we can put that on our list. And you have, of course, lived in LA. Let's tell them about that. Fernando's watching from LA. Yeah, I lived in uh, when I moved back from Beijing um, after working uh, there as the China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. We wanted to live somewhere that wasn't landlocked so we end up in venice beach california that was a lot of fun that was when i was uh teaching andrew and i my husband and i were both teaching at usc annenberg so i have a lot of great memories of la anand's <laughs> watching from andhra andhra pradesh. Pradesh. <laughs> i know you i know you've been to india but uh, have you been to andhra pradesh have you been i to have not been to andhra pradesh i've mostly i was there um down the south um you know and also up to Jaipur, Rajasthan, you know, and, and, and places like that, but no, not under Pradesh. How about Vegas? Definitely been to Vegas quite a few times, and what's happening there is dangerous. <laughs> uh, hi, Terry Thompson. Terry's hi. watching from Vegas. Peggy Wong is watching from hey, Taiwan. Peggy, anyhow. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and, and Peggy is a good friend of all of ours, and she is watching from Taiwan. Uh, we're great, grateful to uh, have her with us. And uh, let's see, people are tagging their friends. We'd love for you to do that. And uh, Fernando suggesting a guest. He says, Father Greg Boyle, founder of Homeboy Industries, would be phenomenal. Great, I'd love to hear. If you have suggestions for guests, please email me, sri at sri.net. We'd love to have them. Uh, Danielle says, watching from Southern Maine with gratitude. Both Sri and May are both brilliant journalists. Thank you so much. Uh, it's all May who is brilliant. Mark is watching from Durham, North Carolina. I have been to Durham, North Carolina. I had a friend who used to work at a university there. Gorgeous, so beautiful. Thank you. Aparna says uh, she's watching from LA and uh, she, he, her organization funded Homeboy. So that's, uh, that's great. And Fernando then jumped onto LinkedIn and posted from there too. So it's great when people are able to do that. Linda's watching from Long Island and yeah. Uh, Paparna is watching from LA for a PJ party. I guess that's a pajama party like you're in pajamas too. So that's, uh, that's great. And uh, Robin Lewis is watching. Tell him about Robin. Hey, Robin. Uh, Robin uh, was, um, when I first moved to New York and I went to Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, Robin was the dean there. And, um, and then later on, when I moved to Beijing to work for the Wall Street Journal, Robin was also there working and my neighbor as well. And I knew him and his wife, Jasmine, very well. And we used to go out all the time. So, hey, Robin. <laughs> Thank you for uh, joining us, Robin. Everybody, please share this. If you're joining us for the first time, I do this show almost, I do it every day, almost always at 9 p.m. Eastern and occasionally during the day around noon Eastern. And the idea is to cover various aspects of COVID-19. Among our recent shows was episode number 99, where we had the chief scientist of WHO and the chief of pandemics at WHO join us, Dr. Samia Swaminathan and Dr. Sylvie Bryan. And we learned so much from them and we talked about the uh, crisis. And of course, uh, lots of questions came in about the role of WHO and China and all of that. And we'll talk to May in a few minutes about China and, it's, and what's happening there because she's covered it and, and won a Pulitzer Prize for her coverage of China. Lots of comments and questions going back and forth. And Linda says, 
I have Mei Fong's book, One Child, but I've not gotten to read it yet. Looking forward to it. My first trip to China was 1984, and it was shocking learning about this policy. So why don't we take a break from the world tour and, uh, uh, and uh, have you talk about your book. But before that, I have to say hi to my dad. Hi, Acha. Great to see you. My dad's watching from Kerala, May, as you know. Did you make it to Kerala yet? I have been to Kerala. Gorgeous place. Love the food. <laughs> All right. So let's 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 talk about your book. And the best way for people to uh, look learn about your book is to go to your website. Uh, well, of course, they can just buy it on any of the web on any of the big websites. But let's uh, talk first about the uh, about your book, and then we'll be joined in a couple of minutes by our colleague Rose Horowitz, our producer, who's got some very specific questions for you. But if you go to mayfong.org, you can learn everything you need to know or want to know about May. Well, I should interject at this point, if you want a quick and easy, fun one to do, uh, I'm probably ruining my book sales that way by telling you, but John Oliver did do an episode where he talked about the one child policy. Um, and he did feature me and my book there on it. So if you want the quick, fun, and adorable version of the book, then do go to check out YouTube, John Oliver, One Child, and you'll find something. And I remember after the show and I went to talk to him, I was like, you know, hey, John, it's really hard to have a comedy show talking about the one child policy. I can't imagine that it's, it's you know, it's, it's really, you know, hard when you're talking about infanticide and, 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 and sexual slavery and, and, you know, all sorts of things like that. And he said, yeah, this was apparently one of his hardest ones to make fun of um, on, on, on the show because of that. But he, you know, if you watch it, you'll still see he did a great job. And, and it was, it was terrific. I'm not showing it because they have, you know, the, the, yeah. uh, the systems are always getting us in trouble when we show video clips from shows like HBO. Uh, because we're all on Facebook, we're on multiple channels. They have the rights on YouTube, but not elsewhere. So I'm not showing it, but people can just search John Oliver, One Child Policy, and they can see a really good, you can see 6 million people have seen this uh, October 6th. What was it like to meet John? I'm a big fan of his. Oh, I was I was totally fangirly. I, mean, so I was like, I love your dimples. I was trying to be very cool, but you know, it all, I lost it. I was. <laughs> And and yeah, and he was and he was talking about you, which is fantastic to uh, see. Well, let's see if I can get at least a still. There you go. This is the career highlight right here, isn't it? Well, I do remember at the time when my book came out, and they said, "Hey, don't you know? Brace yourself. You might be able to get on, you know, Trevor Noah and The Daily Show." But it didn't happen in the end. But th <laughs> then I said, "Well, you know, I'm a big fan of John Oliver. I would love to be in the show." They said, "Never happened." He doesn't have book writers on. He only has to show once a week. He doesn't, you know, it's not going to happen. So this happened years later, way past my expectation. But that is definitely a very special memory that I share. And, and you played it so cool because you told us, you know, you're coming into town for a few hours and you're going to just do the show. And but we didn't we didn't quite we didn't dawn on us till we are watching you with John Oliver and you sent us great photos, which we loved. Uh, so everyone, please uh, do look for this. But let's talk a little bit about the book, and then we'll bring on Rose. Yeah. Um, well, the one-child policy, as you know, a lot of people are familiar with now, was this um, very long, uh, you know, population planning policy that China put in place uh, to to sort of uh, reduce population. And you know, one of the biggest uh, problems of it is that it wasn't strictly speaking one child. So you know, it evolved over time. So um, you know, but basically what it was is population restrictions. And they said, you know, and for only about a third of all households in China, which is still a pretty significant percentage, were actually bound to that very strict one child. You could have exceptions if you were some, you know, if you were part of the countryside and your first child was a girl, uh, then you might be allowed to have a second child. If you know, the parents worked in some um, difficult, you know, dangerous profession like coal mining, then you might have an exception and do that. Um, and, but, you know, by and large, there were still restrictions. You couldn't have as many children as you wanted. And if you did break the rules, then you would be subject to a whole series of punishments. And it would range from everything from fines, sometimes very heavy fines, to um, in some cases, it did happen forced abortions. And all of this uh, basically 
sort of uh, tapered off at about tw a few years back when they went and decided that uh, they needed to jump to a, a two-child policy. But you know the problem with that is that it was a very long-standing policy that went on for three, 30, 30 plus years and it's very significantly reshaped China's uh, population to the point where they have too many men, uh, too, too many old people relative to working population. And so the, this is all significantly affecting their economic growth going ahead. And this is all even before COVID has slowed down their economic growth, because clearly you can't have uh, increased productivity if you have fewer people. Um, and one of the big, big problems you have is you have a significant population of single men. We're talking something like 30 million plus. So that's about the entire size of California's population. And, you know, too many single men um, with no hopes of finding families because there are not enough women, a significant social factor problems with that, loneliness, violence, all these are, are problems going ahead. And just recently, I saw that a Shanghai academic had actually suggested the idea of um, women being able to take two husbands as a way of solving the issue. And um, I remember read, seeing that, that and I, was, I tweeted and I said something like, um, you know, playing off Gloria Steinem's, a woman needs a, a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And I said, in this case, a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a high speed tra rail tra train. Because, I mean, you know, the whole concept of trying to increase population I mean, why not? Why not? You know, give women, you know, subsidized education, or give more women's rights, or or even even give um, you know more equal pay and you know more you know parental friendly policies before going to this kind of crazy DEFCON handmade uh, policies. But that's always the problem with China. They've always come up with some very crazy ideas, um, rather than the kind of family friendly policies that would somehow help um, you know encourage people to have more children and you know and, and in modern societies sure uh, may can you adjust the camera just a little bit we are we want we want you in the middle there you go a little there you go thank you so much um, I'm going to bring on in just a second Rose Horowitz who uh, is our producer and uh, does our fabulous hashtag women to follow and uh, you are of course a woman to follow and everyone should follow you uh, at May Pong writer w-r-i-t-e-r so they can learn from you. Uh, before we do that, just explain that policy again. How far did that get? Was it really taken seriously? Uh, tell us about that. Uh, you know, this policy we're suggesting is that women would be allowed to have two husbands. I know almost everyone I know will think that that's a total nightmare. Well, um, I don't think it's going to be taken seriously, but it is. Um, but the shortage of women in China is resulting in a lot of very serious um, problems. Um, so, for example, there's a definite correlation between areas where they have um, fewer women and um, crime rates, for example. Uh, there is also um, issues. It's also affecting the savings rates. There are a couple of Columbia economists that have put forth um, some very credible numbers that show that families that have sons tend to save more and drive up the prices of property because they need to buy uh, homes, they, they, they want to buy apartments for their sons to make them more eligible for the uh, marriage market as, 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 as husbands. Um, and then one of the things that I had written about was the rise in um, sex dolls, uh, you know, which is actually quite a thing now. Um, you, know, it, you know, it's really exploded. If you go to a website like Taobao, which is one of China's like eBay, um, sex dolls are, are, are like actually a huge sale because there are actually a lot of very lonely uh, men who really have no hope of, of meeting women especially if you, you live in the rural areas and so uh, and and so every year that happens they get sort of bumped up the marriage market and less desirable because there's another flood of younger men coming and also with the similar issues. Thank you. Uh, let's bring in Rose Horowitz on our team. She is our fabulous producer with Vandana Menon and she's going to uh, join me in asking some questions. Hi, Rose. Hi. Hi, Hi Meg. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great to have you here, Rose. You, you. You, you know, to everyone who says nice things about this show, you should know that Vandana Menon and Rose Horowitz make it possible every single day, 108 days. When they signed up, they said they'd help out. They had no idea what they got into. 
and it's made all the difference for the show. So thank you very much, Rose. And let's go with some questions right now. Okay. Uh, I've seen, you know, you've been writing and the center's been writing about uh, anti-Chinese sentiment and hate, hate violence against the Chinese. And uh, Trump in, in his Tulsa rally uh, called it the, the Kung flu. <laughs> and uh, I think named uh, the, you know, the Wuhan flu, the, the Chinese, he went through like 10 or 15 names that he, he's called the Chinese uh, flu. And can you talk about how, what this, what this has meant, um, how this has influenced uh, what's been happening in the U.S. and China? Yeah, well, one of the things that um, when, when the whole COVID uh, uh, pandemic hit, one of the uh, things that we noticed uh, from early on was uh, sort of a rise in um, incidences of hate and bias against Asians, um, East Asians particularly. And um, one of the first things we wanted to do was to try and quantify it because there were all these isolated reports about, well, you know, this and, you know, however many thousand or whatever. So we ran a survey, for example, and that showed that more than 30% of Americans actually witnessed some of these acts of, of um, anti-Asian bias. And, and that resulted in um, senators like Cory Booker and Kamala Harris calling for some action from the DOJ to do something about it. Um, they haven't really done anything about it right now at this point, but the, you know, we're, we're, you know, we and many other media organizations are starting to track this because the problem is, of course, is, you know, and you know, one of the big things that I, I think that we noticed when we ran some of these sources, then of course people say, well, it did originate in China, so we are not being racist by calling it the Wuhan flu or whatever. But the fact of the matter is every time there, there, that there's a, it's called, you know, like someone like President Trump calls it the Wuhan virus or China flu or Kong flu, you actually do see spikes in, in, in hate crimes and incidences of hate, you know, everything from people getting spit at, or um, there was a case where several people were stabbed at a Sam's club uh, because of this. And, you know, those people weren't even, you know, necessarily from China. They just thought they looked Chinese. I think in that case of the, uh, the stabbings in the Sam's club, um, there was a kid and they were Burmese. Um, the problem is, of course, if if um, people are racially motivated, they don't usually ask you to see your passport or anything. They just spew hate. So the concern is that all this, um, you know, fears, you know, make people act, act crazy. So we what we try to do is report on it and, 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 and also make sure that the news is uh, reached out to the communities. And my our expectation now is to see what happens now that the lockdowns are being lifted because the assumption is that possibly these incidences will rise, especially if you have um, higher level officials constantly referring to it as China virus or Kung flu or, or, or names of that sort. And has the media uh, coverage, you know, with all the news that's happening, would you say the media has kept on this story? You know, this it's um, it died down a little bit once the George Floyd protest hit. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, that was was you know the main area of focus for a while. But now that you know, just last week in Tulsa, that um, you know President Trump said Kung flu. I think we're starting to see see if there's a track or rise in in these incidences going forward, because the fact of the matter is, COVID nineteen is probably going to be with us for quite a few years. Um, so, you know, this isn't going to go away, probably. What about the, uh, can you talk about the false information, you know, the, the, that people are spreading that it, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, concocted in a laboratory in Wuhan to, well, to, to kill yeah. the world. You know? <laughs> There's a lot of like, um, stories floating around and some of them have been pushed um, I think to some extent by officials, as you know, Colin, that one, one that, um, you know, that it might have, it might, there is a, a virology lab in Wuhan. So there's a, there's one that's story that's being floated out that says um, it was manufactured in the lab um, and didn't just naturally come about or evolve. Uh, or two, that it was being tracked in the lab, but accidentally escaped out. Um, and, you know, but there's very little scientific evidence as of yet for any one of these theories, but they are floating around that. And all this, of course, 
exacerbates the blame game on China. And, um, and there's also, you know, at this time, of course, it's very clear that certainly experts see this, um, you know, blame China for the virus as a, as a political strategy that President Trump is having as he's facing re-election. Um, you know, blame China for this is, can be very, uh, can strike a trigger response uh, within voters, possibly, especially if people are losing jobs and, and all that. The problem, of course, is once you start the China blame game uh, for COVID particularly, then the backlash of that is going to come upon people who may be Amer who are Americans living in America who look the way I do. <laughs> and like I said, racists don't ask for your passports before they, they do something horrible to you. <laughs> Can you tell us where you're from? Well, <clears throat> my grandparents uh, were from mainland China but they moved to Malaysia um, and I grew up in Malaysia. Uh, so um, several generations removed and then now, of course, I live in America. And how did you come, uh, I just, I know you have an interesting story, so I'm gonna ask you, how did you uh, get to America from, you were in a very small rural area, I think in, in Malaysia? Well, no, actually I grew up in the capital city. Quite oh, little, excuse me. But, but um, but, you know, uh, I, there was no expectation that I would, you know, live abroad or grow anywhere. I, my family, my father was a civil servant. He didn't make a whole lot of money. And there were five girls. Um, I was the fifth daughter. And if you know anything about Chinese families, having five daughters is considered kind of a catastrophe because there's no sons. You know, that's part of the reason why I was interested in the one child policy, because of all this emphasis on boys. And, and, and the problem, you know, and how this is engendered across uh, population planning issues. So I grew up one of five girls and my father was not a happy man because he had so many daughters, but no sons. There was no expectation that they were going to spend a lot of money educating us. Um, and so the expectation of me going to someplace like Columbia and doing graduate school studies was about as likely as going to the moon. But when I was 16, I, I, I won a small, an essay contest. Um, I won a small prize. I didn't even win a top prize. So uh, among the countries that were former British colonies, they, we called, they were called the Commonwealth, um, which is a much more sexy way of saying countries that were colonized and plundered and privileged. You know, Commonwealth suggests that we've shared Commonwealth, but of course it all went to the British Empire. But they had a Commonwealth essay competition. I, and that was open to everybody who, you know, everywhere from Kenya to Malaya, as it was called at the time, to, um, you know, all, all former British colonies. So I won an essay competition. And as a result of that, the queen at that time was visiting Malaysia. So I was invited to meet her. And so it was kind of a cool landmark kind of thing for me. I was 16 years old. I'd never done anything interesting before. And the idea was that if I could by my writing, open up this window uh, to new experiences, then maybe that was what I should be doing. And so the light bulb came on. I was like, okay, I'm going to write. I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be a journalist. And maybe that's the way I'm going to get out of Malaysia and travel the world and see everything else. And that's how I came to New York and had all these adventures. That's a great story. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's very inspiring uh, to hear how you how you got here and uh, your drive, which I think uh, shows in why you would win the Pulitzer. <laughs> so, tell us about tell us about uh, about winning the Pulitzer. What you won the it was for international reporting. Tell us what you reported on. Uh, the Pulitzer was given to um, not just me. It was a shared Pulitzer with some other members of the China Bureau that we had. And uh, we, we wrote about um, the changing face of China's capitalism and how this was affecting China. And it, went, it was a wide ranging series of stories. The stories I primarily wrote about were about um, migrant workers, um, you know, as they worked in, in Beijing as a run, uh, in a run up to the Olympics. So one of the things I was very curious about because of the Beijing Olympics run up, everybody was like building, there was massive building sites everywhere. And I was really curious about the people working those sites and the lives they led, but you couldn't ever see them because most of the time they're working behind all these big, um, you know, signboards and things that covered it up. So I was really curious about that. So I, 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 I 
I managed to make befriend some construction workers and spend a significant amount of time with them. And I wrote about what it was like for these uh, for them to build up the city and work, you know, extremely long and hard hours and suffer injury and sometimes not even get paid uh, to do the work they were doing. Um, yeah. We, we should point out this picture. Who else is in this picture with you? Oh, okay. So the on the left, the gentleman with the uh, blonde hair is Lee Bollinger, you know, um, who is still the president at Columbia. Uh, the lady middle is, is Rebecca Blumenstein, my boss. Um, she was at the time the bureau chief at the Wall Street Journal, but now I believe she is the highest ranking um, female editor at New York Times now. I think she's um, deputy managing editor now. Uh, she's still a great boss, great friend, great journalist. That's great. We only have a few minutes left with you. Uh, we are so grateful, May, for your being here. Let's look at some of the comments and questions. So many of them have come in, people wanting to say hello to you from around the world. So we want to make sure we at least get to uh, uh, say hi. Uh, Parna says that your work with the center, demystifying local government is key. Ashok is watching from Trivandrum also. Um, and uh, Rahadyan is, 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 has put in a link to some of the work. There's just so many, here it is, the Public Center for Public Integrity. Kevin Lau is watching from Hong Kong and says, what is the sentiment in the US on the national security law for Hong Kong? Um, you know, are we talking public sentiment or are we talking official up there? Um, I think for someone like me who watches Hong Kong very closely, there's a great feeling of sadness and concern. Uh, the national security law, for those who don't know anything about it, is um, China has, is will very, very soon uh, implement a national security on Hong Kong. And that and that law will, mo what most Hong Kongers fear will impinge very significantly on their freedoms. It could lead to things like possibly them being easily deported back into China for any perceived uh, infractions. It could lead to significant um, tightening of censorship, um, press laws, the judicial. So these are very, very serious concerns for Hong Kong, which has for many years thrived as a semi autonomous state, but is increasingly being forced to go more under Beijing. Well, thank you for that. Uh, our friend Neil Parikh is watching from Springfield, Virginia, and he is the executive producer of the show we mentioned, the New York Times Read Along. And tomorrow, there's a good reminder to tell everybody that tomorrow our show is uh, with uh, Professor Pavan Dingra, who's the author of Hyper Education Why Good Schools, Good Grades, and Good Behavior Are Not Enough. So, a big new book from Pavan. And we'll also be joined by Marina Korean, MD, co-host of She's On Call, a big new show that uh, Marina Korean and Sujana Chandrasekhar uh, are putting together, have put together, have launched. And we will be talking tomorrow, 8.30 to 10.15 a.m. At 11 a.m. will be the show, She's On Call. And we would love all of you to join us for both the 8.30 and 11 a.m. shows. And Marina's co-host Sujana Chandrasekhar will be with us in a few minutes just to talk about some of the crazy stuff happening around the COVID-19 crisis in America. How do you explain, uh, uh, May, the success that some East Asian countries have had in battling it compared to the United States? What do you blame and who do you blame for the situation we find ourselves in today? I, you know, I covered SARS when it happened, when I hit um, Hong I, I landed in Hong Kong literally when SARS hit. And so I covered a couple of pandemics. I've written about bullet flu. I think one of the significant things you do see in Asia is mass culture. People do not feel it strange or weird or impinging on their freedom in personal ways, just to wear a mask if they feel that they could infect other people. And so that's a big problem here now. There, um, a lot of people may not necessarily have that same kind of thinking. But really, it's it needs to be uh, the mental framework needs to be in the same way as you know washing your hands or covering your mouth when you cough. Um, and and right now in the moment, it's sort of taken on this kind of a culture war significance, which really, when really it's a public health issue. And yes, thank you for uh, saying that. Let's look at some more of the comments that comes in. They're coming in. Christine DeBello, DeBello says, hello from Conroe, Texas, lived in Hong Kong way back when my flatmate and I, when my flatmate worked for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Daniel says, we have been very grateful to our governor who locked down the state in Maine 
uh, very early on in COVID-19. Sudha Parekh, who's Neil's mom, is watching from Hudson, uh, Hastings on Hudson. Very good topic. And uh, and Jonathan says he's been to other union squares. I didn't even know there were, I mean, I guess they could be, I didn't know uh, that there were um, other co uh, others as well. My dad, uh, as you know, in India, the India border with China, there's a lot of uh, yeah. uh, action going on for China to flex its muscles in the middle of a pandemic has astonished the world. How do you explain its behavior at this time, May? Well, you know, I've always been a pessimist. I'm not surprised it's flexing muscles. Now, this is actually the best time for China to flex its muscles because everyone else is looking elsewhere, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you think, um, you know, these world leaders are going to, you know, have the time to figure, you know, this is the best time for you, for any country that wants to sort of make significant inroads and doesn't want to have any kind of overseas, you know, mounted, you know, resistance or opposition to it, you know, um, yeah, I, I initially did say, you know, a couple of months ago, wow, you know, this is, this is, you know, Hong Kong, you know, all these issues that they're going to clamp down hard on Hong Kong and very few countries. I mean, what do you think the U.S. is going to come back now and say anything about that? They can hardly say, well, we support free protest when the police here in many cities have not been doing that at all. Right. You know, so, and you know, so this is unfortunately a bad time for strong men to well it's a good time for them it's not so good for the rest of us to 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 authoritarian regimes to increasingly um put the boot down i know you uh, many people may who have joined us right now may have missed the uh conversation we had about your appearance on the john oliver show and uh and radian is putting in one of the comments where you told uh john that you love his dimples and uh, Vandana, our other producer, has put in a link so you can all watch that uh, episode of the love la last last week tonight. Uh, that uh, and lots of other folks are watching. And Brown Pundit, our friend Rafiq, is watching and says hello. Um, Ashok is asking, have they changed the policy, and what are the changes that they've made? Well, they've moved it to a uni uh, a national two-child policy now. But, you know, uh, there's still issues like if you want three or four or five, right? That's the, uh, and there's an the expectation they will eventually drop all restrictions on that. But there are actually concerns now that they could move to mandating two children or more in, 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 for, for populations that they want to have more children. For example, women uh, who are educated, you know, which, you know, uh, is a population that they want to produce more. So there are a lot of concerns now about, you know, making it so that people will have more children, tightening up laws on divorce and making it harder for people to divorce, um, you know, requiring, you know, um, you know, and then there's, a, there's discussions about the social credit system that they do have in place and whether you will be given extra credit for having more children or doing any of the more socially acceptable behavior that China, uh, Beijing wants to reward. Um, so it's, it's, it's really um, in the realm of, um speculation to some extent but they are having a significant population drop they are trying very hard to reverse that it is very hard to do and beijing historically has had a history of trying to do some very radical things in this field so uh rafiq says i must read your book which is nice and uh he uh, and then can you talk a little bit about the 421 family dynamics and how this has affected the financial future of the single child. And one more question, uh, uh, because many children grew up without any siblings, they didn't learn skills of getting along well with other people. Any thoughts on that? And since you have twin boys who, uh, as with my twins, they are also not necessarily the best at getting along just because you have a sibling, right? Yeah, well, no, I mean, having the two of them in lockdown, I wish, at first, you know, when they're, when they're locked down, it's like, how sweet, at least they have an inside playmate. And after the second one, when they're fighting each other, you're like, Ugh. but um, yeah, the um, so one of the issues is not just a question of, you know, once you change the structure of family planning and you say, well, you know, we regulate in only one family, then a lot of things get changed in the process, too. And one of them is the, the family fragility issue. 421 refers to the fact you have four grandparents. Uh, two parents and one kid. So the structure is fragile in the sense that if anything happens to the child, then there's a huge sense of devastation. And in, and I witnessed that when I covered the Sichuan um, earthquake, 
where um, which happened in a part of the country where they had actually tested out the one child policy before they launched it nationwide. So as a result, many of the children killed were the only children. So um, and the four to one, one of the biggest phenomena of that is that the uh, children from the one child policy are now in their 30s, the earliest uh, batch. So parents are aging and they have um, they don't have the family support because, um, you know, when you get older and you have more cho children and siblings to take care of older people, that's much more helpful. But if you have one kid and all of this rests on his or him or her shoulders, that's a very significant burden. It has big issues and implications for public health, for, for, for savings rates, all sorts of issues. And for during COVID-19 now, which is, you know, affecting older people in bigger ways, uh, you can imagine how hard that would be for many people in China. It's not just one kid. Uh, Renee Edelman's watching and she says hi to Rose and to May and says it's great to hear this chat with um, with May and uh, thank you Renee for all your support all these 108 days. Uh, uh, Brown Pundit says my brother-in-law RIP worked for UN Population Fund in the 80s aiding China to implement the one child policy. That's so interesting. But China got a lot of help from overseas during its years. There was a time, as you know, May, when India and China had the same GDP. And then in 1980, it just took off in a way that uh, that not just India, so many other countries were left in its dust. Well, there's another parallel. Um, the UN actually gave gold medals to both India and China at one point for controlling the population. In India's case, it was Indira Gandhi's forced sterilization policy that happened for a very short time. but. And um, for China was the one child policy. And, you know, that's that was what they thought of was exemplary at the time. But clearly, if you dial back now and look at that, um, there were very severe problems of giving that kind of a reward a award to it, especially on the human rights infringement issues. Uh, Twyla says so impressive. And Radian says uh, there are uh, quite a few great Malaysian restaurants in New York City, by the way. One is Penang. Not sure if it's still there. It's part of a chain. And we worry about all the restaurants and what will happen to them uh, after all of this. And that's something that we will we will all learn. Uh, Twyla says the spirit of those in Hong Kong is remarkable. And East Asia still has cultures where individualism isn't as profoundly part of the culture as it is in the in, in the US. And of course, people wear masks. Uh, Mayank asks, will Tibet be ever independent again? Well. That, that's a, that's a whole entire show all by itself. <laughs> and uh, Anand says, Dear May, uh, as a journalist, could you please put through some insights on the ongoing situation on the border of India and China? Yeah. And I will I will just say, in, uh, we won't put all this pressure on May to talk about that beyond a point. We'll have a show on the India-China issue. We found some great experts who will contribute to this, and uh, we look forward to uh, having that expertise. So, but May, if you would like to comment on that, you already sort of talked about China flexing its muscles. Yeah, um, this, yeah, uh, I haven't been following that issue closely, but as I said, you know, China geopolitically has been, like, particularly the Southeast Asian region with its neighbors. So it is not surprising in a way that some of these, I mean, skirmishes are happening. I think there is an anticipation that that will happen more in the future because what is the check going to be on China? Um, Xi Jinping right now has got a term for life, basically. Um, uh, the traditional, you know, geopolitical uh, checks have been weakened significantly. Some of them, as we see NATO, um, the US, the alliance with Europe that they have had traditionally. So, um, you know, where are the checks coming from? I mean, what's, you know, where's it going to come from? Many countries are busy dealing with COVID in their own backyards they don't have time to deal with this right now and i'm going to have rose ask you a final question but before that just a comment if you if if you would on uh how is it that he was able to pull that off even in the height of the soviet union the communist party had a regular succession plan as you know and we had you know successor uh, leaders and that's how gorbachev was able to come into power and reform how is it that the politburo uh, was able, I don't know if they even use that term, I'm sorry, I don't know, but what what made this gentleman the one who was able to establish this kind of power, whereas his predecessors, I'm sure some of them would have liked to have had power for life. How did this, how did that happen? And then a question from Rose, and then we'll let you go. 
Well, um, you know, Xi Jinping has very, very many times specifically stated how he has been very affected by the example of the crumbling of the Soviet Union. And um, so he was very careful to take the lessons from what not to do in that one. He kept always saying that, you know, um, you know, you needed to man up, you know, you couldn't be like, uh, because if, 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 if he, he didn't man up, then China was going to be like the Soviet Union and, and break apart. And so I think that was very much part of the decision process uh, and the careful uh, coalition building that enabled him to sort of pull this, you know, tremendous uh, political coup that happened at this time. Um, uh, you know, um, and, and that's my interpretation of how he managed to do it. Um, and of course, I'm sure there's a lot more going under the scenes of, of that, that front. Uh, Rose, what was your question? Um, I know we're short on time. So. Okay. Uh, well, I was going to ask you, you know, as the daughter of, um, as one of five daughters with a father who thought, as you said, in your words, a catastrophe, you know, what would you, what advice would you have for young people uh, who are determined and, and want to pursue a career when there are so many obstacles in their way? Well, I've always had the whole philosophy that um, there are always going to be people who tell you that you cannot do something, you know, and really, when, if you, it's really up to you to find a way, um, you know, because you have to, because if you, if you get, you know, if you, if you believe everything people say and say that, you know, you can't do this, you're never going to do it. So it's really up to you to find a way. But that said, having gone through that and moved to that, once you have made a way for yourself, then it's really up to you to make a way for others. <laughs> And so I, I think that's a good philosophy to live by, you know, find a way and then make a way. And do you think you're doing that in your work with Center for Public Integrity? Well, I hope so. I hope I, I'm doing it in all sorts of ways. I try to mentor young writers. I sit in quite a lot of, um, you know, judging boards and things like that, to, you know, things that encourage writing endeavors or grant making and all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, in my own small way, I, I, I hope I'm trying to, you know, um, make a difference. I think we all do. Thank you. We know you're making a difference, May, and congrats on all your work and congrats on your work at the Center for Public Integrity. Uh, before you go, I'm going to bring on our doctor, Sujana Chandrasekhar, who is going to answer some questions about what the heck is going on here. And we're going to have a bridge to that conversation. Let's say hi to Sujana. Hi. Hi. Very nice to hear you. Uh, bef before you go, May, here's our friend Junie Lau, who is watching from Singapore. And this is a question that the doctor can uh, can answer, but I want you to also reflect on it. And I'm sorry it's covering up everybody's face. A warm hello from Singapore to May Sri and Kevin Lau in Hong Kong. A friend returned to the U.S. last Thursday after six years in Singapore. Upon landing in Chicago, there was no COVID checks, travel declarations, or mask wearing. It's sad that mask wearing has become so politicized. As one US doctor said, healthcare workers are not frontliners, they are last liners. The public are in the front line. So may a comment and then we'll let you go and Sujana will take it from there. Well, um, I think Junie is very right. I mean, if you, if you everybody who's traveled outside um, the US um, will have this incredible sense of why, you know, people are covering, people are being responsible, you're filling out all these forms, this happened way back when, uh, even with SARS, you know, you go through the gantries, they'll scan, you can see your temperature check, all these things. Um, I, I, I think the US sense of exceptionalism has, in this case, really served it badly. <laughs> you know, that we're special, we're somehow different, you know, we, we don't need to take all this, uh, inf uh, you, know, uh, you know, all these experiences and learning from other people have had, and we don't need to, we're somehow different, we don't, we don't need to do it. <laughs> And as we see from Texas and Florida with the reopening, they are regretting it now. And yeah, and here's uh, people responding. Radhyan says, great advice regarding occupations. I hope to instill in my five-year-old goddaughter when she's older. And Linda says, uh, really great conversation. And Robin Lewis says, great show. Uh, give a ring, May. So that's, uh, he's saying that. And we'll let you go. Uh, May, Rose, do you want to stick around and chat with the doctor too? Um, no, it's okay. I'll see right. tomorrow. So, so yeah, Rose, Rose, Rose is one of the producers of the show. She's on call, which everyone can watch on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube and on LinkedIn. So everyone, please follow at She's On Call, and you'll be able to watch the show. 
with Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar, 11 a.m. tomorrow on Sundays. I will, I will say one thing, you know, just that I think it's really great that we're able to do this show, especially now as we're seeing this um, new spikes, and you know, these spikes in um, and, you know, there is no second wave. We're still on the first wave. And so I'm very eager to hear uh, Dr. Uh, Sujana and uh, Dr. Uh, Korean. Korean, sorry, uh, Korean, uh, talk about talk about this tomorrow. Thank you. May Thank and you. Rose, we'll see you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, they were fantastic. And I know you were very patiently listening. And this is our second show today, Doc. Yeah. We have to stop meeting like this. We yeah. really are going to have something to say. Well, you, you're, you're fantastic. And we just can't get enough of all the information you have to share with us. And we're so grateful to you for doing that. Uh, um, we want to tell everybody that you are an ENT surgeon in New York and your people are very familiar if they've been watching the show because you and Dr. Kurian have been on the show multiple times and we got the idea for a spin-off show called She's On Call and let's tell people about it. It's going to be on tomorrow, the third episode and tell us two things, who your guests are and why you called it She's On Call. Well, we're very excited about the show. Um, let me start with who our guests are. Jordi Cohen is from University of Pennsylvania. She's a nephrologist, which is a kidney specialist and an epidemiologist, a true clinician scientist. And I think she's gonna be able to unwrap some of the research that's going on that's affecting us. And then uh, Olga Garcia is a fifth year senior surgery resident in California. Uh, so we're going to talk to her about her experiences as a resident, the experience in California where the numbers are in fact surging and Southern California and Northern California are acting as if they are different states. But she also is a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force. So I'm really excited to hear from both of them about their experiences in medicine with COVID and of course with leadership as women. Um, that leads me into why she's on call. She's on call is sort of a tongue in cheek, uh, several entendre. Marina is a general surgeon, I'm an ENT surgeon. Um, we are always on call for our patients and their families, but we're on call for our communities um, all the time. And it's a joy, it's really an amazing opportunity to take care of people like this. But um, sometimes, people say doctor and they automatically think male. And in this country, they automatically think white male. And we see it over and over and over again. And I belong to a huge uh, mother's group of physicians on Facebook. And the stories from younger women are just awful where they will have counseled the patient for a long time, introducing themselves as doctor and either be called by their first name or be asked at the end, when is the real doctor coming in? So it's a way to highlight our ability to discuss medicine and discuss issues that matter to patients and their families, um, and to let you know we're on call, we're available. We're available to answer your questions and we're available as a sounding board, both in person and on our show. And tomorrow they can join us at 11 a.m. Eastern time. The two hosts are Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Kurian and 11 a.m. So how do they find it? They are either your friends on Facebook or Marina's friends on Facebook, or they go and follow at She's On Call on Facebook. That's the easiest way, or on Twitter at She's On Call, and the hashtag is She's On Call. We've got lots of questions coming in, so let's go right to them, questions and comments uh, 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 coming in. Uh, first of all, Radian says the sexism is appalling in 2020. It sure is. It sure is. And it, it never seems to stop. And it shocks me that it's still here in 2020. You know, this week, um, I got home early enough to watch uh, one of the major network evening news and uh, four doctors and uh, three doctors and a nurse were interviewed about COVID. All the doctors were men and the nurse was a woman. And I think unless everyone is deliberate, these sort of uh, subliminal barriers will always stay up. Thank you. Uh, Twyla says, Sujana, I suggest Dr. Tanuja Damani, Chief of Esophageal Surgery at NYU Langone Robotic Surgery. 
Um, I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, esophageal surgery is very difficult. We used to have to open, so the esophagus is the feeding tube, so it connects your back of your mouth to your stomach. And in order to remove the esophagus, we'd have to make huge incisions, sometimes even open part of the sternum or the breastbone to get there, um, have potential complications with uh, your lungs. And the robotic surgery has really changed um, the way people can recover from these large surgeries that can be done mi as minimally invasive as possible. Thank you. It's a great idea. Rahadian is putting out your website uh, at ENT and Allergy and, <laughs> yeah. and, and all your degrees, or I guess these are only some of your degrees, or what is what is what is he put out there? So it's MD for medical doctor, FACS. I'm a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Uh, I was president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, uh, which is ear, nose, and throat surgery. Um, you know, we just have a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I think the Beatles said something about uh, handing us pieces of paper uh, instead of something real. I, doctors got a lot of pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, this is this is great. Uh, Twyla has a very important question. Is it okay to tie a knot in people who don't wear masks? Or I think we should be carrying potato guns. No, no, no. I do not advocate... Um, I do not advocate for violence, but uh, you can wave at them from a distance, especially if you're outside, you can actually pass them very quickly. But if they're going into a store, into a restaurant, into an office, they must be wearing a mask. Um, that is the way to keep the numbers going lower and lower, as we are seeing in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And we're seeing exactly the opposite uh, in the Southern and Western states. and the way to stop it is as simple as a simple face covering. Um, if the mask is loose on the sides, you can tie a knot in that to make it tight, but um, but just wear a mask. It's so easy, just wear a mask. And I think on my radio show today, when you were kind enough to join us, you you were a little more explicit and you said, wear a darn mask. <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I was wondering how much I could curse on the radio and I realized they're also uh, controlled by the FCC. Rahadian says, bluntly, it would have been appalling in 1990, the sexism that we're talking about now. Mark mm. says, sorry, go ahead. It was, it was appalling. It was appalling in the 1980s. It was appalling in the 1990s. And it's appalling in the 2000s and the 2010s and now in the 2020s. So don't worry, it's appalling. Mark says, you can add that to the disasters we're fighting, economic, racism, coronavirus, and yes, sex sexism and misogyny. Uh, and Twyla says to the doc, I love potato guns. Message me and I'll give you deets for Dr. Damani. I'll probably have been dead without her and robotics. Oh, I'm so glad you're doing well, Twyla. I really am. That's a tough operation to go through. And, and like I said, I think the minimally invasive procedures are amazing. Um, it's very interesting, though, if you're talking about sexism, Several of the instruments we use for robotic surgery, I'm a size six and a half hand. That's a very common female hand size. Men are average seven and a half, sometimes eight. The instruments were initially designed for a seven and a half or an eight hand. So you'd get a cramp trying to hold the instruments as a woman. And the, the uh, equipment manufacturers heard us in surgery and, and saw that women were struggling with man-sized instruments and made all the instruments accessible to everybody. And I think, you know, we just have to keep telling people. Um, you know, uh, Mei Fong said, uh, you know, raise yourself up and then raise up the next person. My favorite quote by Audrey Hepburn, who I love, was, if you want help, look to the end of your arms. You have two hands. The right hand is for you to help yourself and the left hand is for you to help the next person. And I think when we believe that, we can actually face all of the isms that there are and all the hardships that there are and make this world better. Twyla says, thank you, doctor. And she says, love the good doctor, curse if you want. Uh, yeah, I do, I do, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, she's, she's giving you permission, so that's awesome. Um, I've heard stories about early um, situations with the earliest surge of female surgeons in things like amputation found it difficult in terms of the heights of the tables, the, you know, we're talking at the early 1900s 
and just have getting the, you know, because they used to, as you know, they used to use saws and things like that, getting the leverage. And that was used against them saying that we females couldn't be surgeons. Yeah. Uh, we have had every excuse thrown in the book of why we can't, we can't, we can't. And I think, you know, again, every time you talk to a woman who have who has even a modicum of success, she will have heard the word no all the time. I heard it so often that I just decided it's a way that people pause to take a breath. They just kind of say no. <laughs> and then I went and did whatever I want to do anyway. So uh, uh, I think table height, I think the instrument size, you know, we do use step stools. So if you happen to be operating with a very tall person and I'm five, four and a quarter on a really good day, um, I might use a step stool. In the old days, I would have used step stools. In the new days, that guy often will sit down so that he will bring himself down to like a five, seven height if he starts at six feet or something. And then I can easily work with him. And then neither of our backs is strained and we actually end up ergonomically doing quite well. And there are some, uh, some of your surgeries take a really long time, right? Yeah, so there's uh, some, of, uh, uh, some of the surgeries are many, many long hours wearing masks on our feet. And surprisingly, we all breathe through our masks. Um, many of them are sitting down wearing masks where the fingers are moving oh so subtly for hour after hour after hour. Um, you know, but the energy level is amazing. And back in the bad old days when I was doing big head and neck cancer surgeries uh, as a resident, we'd be finished with a 14, 15, 16 hour case. And that's when the Madonna songs came on because that's when we were closing and we needed that energy and we were singing and dancing along to Madonna as we were sewing up, getting the energy to make the end of the case as terrific as the rest of the case. Uh, I love hearing that. And folks <laughs> are watching our conversation with Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. It's Saturday night on Sundays from 11 to noon, she and Dr. Marina Korean host, She's On Call. And tomorrow they have two terrific doctors joining them. And we hope you'll check out the show Sundays at 11 Eastern on Facebook, Twitter, and on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So just check, look for She's On Call and you will find them. I'm just looking at the Drudge Report here, some of the headlines. Wow. Their case becomes political risk. Virus cases hit all time high, third day in a row. Florida, Arizona peak, hospital strains, strain, US, U, EU bans Americans. This is like the worst outcome we could have had for the hundred days of sacrifice we made in America. And this is, I think, in some ways self-inflicted. This is a failure at the highest levels of our government. And there, the result of all of this is that now Americans are being banned from traveling and we have not, as Rose said, we have not flattened the curve. This is not the second wave. This is the first wave. This is the first wave. You know, we've had, as guests on our show, we had Dara Cast, who's an emergency room physician, who's uh, incredible, outspoken, well-spoken, talks about, you know, it's easy to, it's not easy, but it's straightforward to control this. Testing, uh, tracing, tracking, and then isolation. It's so easy wear a mask, stay away from people, do the quarantine if you've been exposed. We had Nadia Hernandez on who works at UT Houston, the largest hospital in the United States of America, the most hospital beds in a single institution. They are over capacity, their ICUs are filled. And I have to tell you, for those of us in practice in New York and New Jersey, seeing that all the lessons that we learned with such difficulty. We, we have lost over 600 healthcare workers to COVID who got the disease from taking care of patients. So we have lost 125,000 people in the United States from this disease. The fact that we did this in real time just in the past three months and all of these states and our central government has not learned from us is really devastating. I have to tell you the emotional blow that that takes on healthcare workers is really high. 
because we suffered through, I remember the first show I was on with you, Sri, I explained to you what is PPE, which is personal protective equipment, which is masks and gloves and gowns and face shields. And normal people didn't know what PPE was. Now everybody knows what it is, but we're still not wearing masks in public. We're still congregating in bars. We're still not doing the right things. We're still not testing enough people and we're not tracking enough people. And if we can do all this, you know, you open this with a question about a patient, a, a person who had returned from the Far East. Protective equipment. Yeah, returned from the Far East and had no testing, returned to one of our major airports to O'Hare and there was no screening, no questions, no thermometer, no nothing. We saw this from the beginning. So this is an abject failure of screening people who are coming in. This is an abject failure of counseling our citizenry with one voice to listen to science. And part of why we started She's On Call is we saw this lack of science, this lack of facts, this lack of logic. And we'd really like a safe space where people can come and learn what we know as facts and what we consider as medical opinion and take that information and then share it with your friends, your family, your enemies. I don't care who you share it with, but you know, this is the way we disperse good information. We are an amazing country. We're an amazing world and we can overcome all these obstacles but I think that May was right. The hubris um, took us in the wrong direction and we're seeing that now play out in the Southern and Western states, which is really upsetting to all of us who felt like, okay, we made this struggle and this sacrifice so the rest of our country could be safe. Thank you. We have uh, people tuning in. Other says, great. Uh, Daryl says, I love your temperament. You should be the Surgeon General. You know, there was already an Indian guy and already a Kannada speaker, so I lost. <laughs> Twyla <laughs> says, agree that emotional blow uh, high on healthcare workers, also devastating to regular folks who look for guidance and leadership without politics. And Twyla says she once videotaped a 13-hour open heart. Yikes, she says. And you know, when you do those open hearts back in the day, my job as the intern, as the 22 year old, just, you know, fresh, you know, wet behind the ears from medical school was to hold the heart while they poured ice water on my hand and the heart so they could sew the anastomosis on the backside of the heart. My entire job was to hold the heart and turn away like this so I wouldn't get in the surgeon's way. Those were long operations, but the patients did really well. And we learned so much about patients and patients and caring for others during that time. Junie points out that we had a show with uh, Columbia and twin parents because all three of us were pin or twin parents, Rose, May, and me, we all have twins. And in April to May, the Columbia alumni associations across China, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Singapore raised $2 million to buy and send PPE to New York and New Jersey hospitals where Columbia alumni work and New York Fire Department and NYPD. I'm so proud of Junie and everybody who made that possible, but it is a shame that this yeah. great country needed to get from East Asia, from those countries or anywhere in the world had to, because we weren't providing uh, these, these, this simple equipment for our own healthcare workers. And that we are told that that was a hoax, that we were, it isn't true that this was all going on. And you know from your friends uh, that this was all absolutely true and absolutely tragic. You know, we're still seeing it. So we're seeing reports from Florida hospitals and Texas hospitals and Arizona and Alabama hospitals which they somehow were not prepared for the surge. Maybe it was just gonna affect I don't know, the liberals in the Northeast, I don't know who this was supposed to affect, uh, but the virus doesn't care what your politics are. And so we are actually seeing PPE uh, scarcity again down there. We're seeing uh, questions about how much do I need to use? What do I need to use? You know, if, you'll, uh, if any of you watched uh, the show with Nadia Hernandez, she comes home from the hospital, 
takes an outdoor shower, Listerine's up, like defumigates as much as she can before she goes near her children. I mean, these are the precautions people are taking so that they don't bring a, a potentially deadly virus home. Thank you. Uh, we have so many great comments coming in and we wanna share some of them with you. Uh, Twyla said, uh, Twyla has uh, talked about what it means for the workers. And Rahadian points out that because of a single incident with the, if you remember the shoe bomber mm -hmm. trying to hide his shoe, we take off our shoes at airports because of a single incident. And now we should be taking, uh, wearing masks and using appropriate protocols. It's a no brainer. I've not made that comparison. Radian, thank you. Very insightful. Uh, it, in fact, nobody died when Richard Reed did his uh, mm -hmm. act. And in fact, that was probably the longest lasting impact of his act of terror was, you know, causing so much difficulty and confusion at airports. And that's what he was able to do. And here we have 125,000 probably Americans will be dead uh, if, uh, by when, when this is over, if not more sadly, and nothing is being done. Renee asked an important question. How do you, what do you do when you go to a restaurant? Do you eat outside? Do you still wear a mask? What's going on? So we were very excited to go out to a restaurant for the first time in three months uh, this past week. Um, it was uh, near our home and we have uh, seven of us in the house right now. And uh, my in-laws who are elderly, my father-in-law goes to dialysis, so he's immune compromised. Uh, my husband and myself and the kids who are big, they're adult children. And um, we sat outside, they had set up tables in the parking lot very nice social distancing. We took off our masks for the entirety of the meal to order and to eat. The servers all wore masks. I asked if they felt comfortable and they were comfortable. We were outside, so it was very safe. They had a QR code uh, that they showed my, my smartphone so that my the menu appeared on my phone. So I didn't even have to touch a menu. And they had uh, paper menus if people wanted paper menus that were then disposable, but they were doing their best to save the environment. I have to tell you, it is such a pleasure to eat outside. It is such a pleasure to contribute back to the economy in that way, just to have the, the joy of eating outside. But we did absolutely maintain social distance from other people. So we stayed within our bubble uh, and enjoyed our time and, uh, and are looking forward to the next uh, next such experience. I think it's really important for people to re understand that this doctor who knows what she's talking about, that is her first meal in 100 plus days. Think about how many people all over this country against all good guidance were having meals because they yeah. thought it was the right thing. They were being pushed to open in places like Texas. And it's just really tragic. Let's look at some of the other comments. Matt Schifrin says, well said, Dr. Chandrasekhar. And so Matt, Matt is a an editor at Forbes magazine and um, has some uh, very good insights into not just the health and economic um, equation, but also college admissions. And uh, really, I think there's a lot to be said for parents whose children are either going to college for the first time this year or going back to college, how safe will they be? I think there's going to be quite a few interesting stories coming out about that. I hope you'll connect me with, with Mark or Mark tweet at me. Yeah, at yeah, yeah. We'd yeah. love to have you uh, talk about that because we're certainly exploring those issues. Radian, I am so sorry to uh, see, see oh. this. Um, your mother died of COVID-19 two months ago today. Uh, I take the maladaptive response to PPEs personally and it makes me angry. I am so sorry, Radian, and I am angry on your behalf. We should all be that the sacrifice that was made by by everybody in the Northeast, by folks who were the frontline workers, frontline uh, healthcare workers, the delivery men and women, the grocery store clerks who went into work every day, the first responders, and then everything that's been done out of DC is so unacceptable. And this is really tragic, Radian. And I, I, all, all I can say is I, I'm right there with you. Uh, and I, I am so angry. Uh, here are some of the other other comments uh, that are uh, coming in now. Uh, Radian also says, each of the 125,000 people who died had one, a few, many people who loved and valued them. It's sobering and angering. Uh, and Radian says, we can expect numerous suits against 
nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities in the coming years. Uh, Mark says, I wear a mask in the restaurant, but I take it off when eating and then putting it back on. Some idiots want the virus to kill off New Yorkers. Uh, they wanted that, right? That's sort of what they were thinking. And yeah, we'll do this. Uh, I roll and anger. Um, this is just so um, unexpected. You know, one, of, one of my dear friends is a, was a police officer and he died on May 11th in the intensive care unit. Um, several, almost three quarters, I think, of the small town police force co contracted COVID. He was 45. He leaves behind three small children, you know, teenagers and younger, a beautiful wife, a mother, a mother-in-law, friends, relatives. We leave behind uh, a huge community of friends and loved ones. And so, uh, you know, I think, Sri, you and I were talking about that New York Times cover when we hit the uh, 100,000 uh, deaths, I think. Um, and, you know, each story, even if it's a line, tells you the richness of each life. And so one life is too many. And 125,000 lives are really too many. And this is something where easy action, yes, and easy action uh, of wearing a mask, of being respectful to the people around you, of washing your hands. These are so simple. These actions are so simple. People are saying, oh, my carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide is gonna build up. I do 14, 15 hour operations with a mask on. I'm not dead and I'm not hypoxic when I'm operating on you. We can breathe like this. Is it uncomfortable? Absolutely. Is missing your loved one's funeral because it's COVID time really uncomfortable? Yes. So I think we need to be very rational when we decide to do or not follow uh, guidance. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You well, know, I, I was reading that front page and I unfortunately found uh, the two line obituary of a radiologist whom I would send cases to. And he was so smart and so terrific. And, you know, to die in your 60s, that's not right. That's yeah. not right. You know, none of this is right. None of what has happened is right. And, and the lack of PPE, the lack of being able to see your relative as they pass, you know, the fear that all of the healthcare workers, police, firemen, EMTs, sanitation workers, grocery clerks, everybody's got this fear of what they may be bringing home. You know, the AIDS crisis was terrible. I, I trained during the AIDS crisis. It was awful and we were very scared until we kind of figured it out. And we were still scared, but not as personally. We never lost healthcare workers in the AIDS crisis. We've lost over 600 from this. Radhyan says, if, if people think that CO2 buildup is an issue, they're wearing their masks incorrectly. And yeah. I completely agree. Mark says uh, that Raleigh bars open in defiance of state order. So even when the state is ruled by a smart governor, the local municipalities or just local merchants are stepping up in a bad way. and breaking the rules and doing this. It's just, I just, the kind of willful ignorance as uh, as Twyla describes them is is so sad. Uh, folks are fighting a progressive governor. Uh, they're absolutely scaring me. Linda says a relative had it fortunately recovered, but said her symptoms much worse than she went through chemo a, a few, a couple of years ago. Imagine worse than chemo. And that helps. And, and you know, the lingering, the lingering symptoms are really quite bad. So even if you don't get intubated, even if you don't end up in the ICU, the lingering uh, breathing symptoms, the lingering muscle fatigue, and we're actually seeing some lingering thought process disturbances. We're seeing some very, uh, unfortunately, neuroviral uh, findings in people. We're seeing long-term smell and taste disturbance in people. So we're seeing some very odd findings that last far longer than we would expect given the relative rapidity of that person's recovery. And this is, and this is just, I'm just reading these and looking at one example after another. And these are only a thousand names. So imagine a hundred thousand of these, a hundred 
pages of a thousand names. I just cannot. I mean, I'm so upset. You, you, read one on, you read one on the air. You said he wore a bolo tie or a bow tie. And I thought, oh my God, I would have loved this guy. Like just those, I mean, it's beautifully done. The kudos to the New York Times because the, the one or two lines they wrote about everybody how can you summarize a person in just one or two lines, but you can summarize the essence of the human who was lost to this earth. And that was very beautiful to me. Let me read you one of uh, one of our friends, Floyd Cardoz, 59 from Montclair, New Jersey, Indian chef of fine dining. And you know about Tabla and other places and so many, I mean, we could do a whole episode where all I did would be reading these out. Joe Diffey, uh, 61 Nashville Grammy, winning country music star. Um, one of these said he was at peace on his Harley. That was his line about him. A 49 year old IT project manager remembered for his love of trivia. Uh, Chicago, his Walmart coworkers were like family. Uh, I mean, transgender immigrant activist and uh, founded a food pantry and just name after name after name, as you know, so Jana, on this show, I read the names of, of, of those killed in police brutality and because every name has a story. And here we're seeing a thousand names, a hundred thousand names with a story. And, the pre and this is not a political statement to say what I'm about to say, that this president as a, as a candidate said that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and would not lose a single voter from his base. Well, he can now be responsible for 100,000 deaths and he will not lose, and he has shown that he would not be losing people from his base. 88% of Republicans still support him. That tells you something about where we are as a country. And um, we are seeing here so many comments coming in and uh, we are just grateful to everyone for being here. So Janelle, we need you, you to get a good night's sleep because you have a big show tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Before you go, I want to give you a chance to give us some guidance. As if people aren't able to get up to watch your show, we want everybody to do that. The show is called She's On Call, and tomorrow you have two fabulous guests with you and your co-host, Dr. Marina Korean, and they can find it on Facebook uh, at She's On Call, on Twitter at She's On Call, on YouTube at She's On Call. You'll also be on your personal Facebook, Marina's personal Facebook, and I'll be resharing on my platform so people can see it there. But we'd love for everybody to follow you on Facebook and on Twitter. And you're on Twitter yourself, at Dr. Sujana ENT, Dr. Sujana ENT. So give us a couple of thoughts before you go. So I want to tell people, I you know, I'm a Pollyanna. I've always thought of the glass not only as half full, but it's always kind of brimming over. I think we are in a dark time, but we're in a time of great promise. I think that um, the unfortunate, the horrific deaths that we have seen in the African-American community have propelled everyone to action like I have never seen before, having lived in the United States since 1969. I've never seen the community come together like this and understand like this. I think the understanding that we need healthcare, that we need rational leadership, I think all of these things are going to help us and particularly the, the younger generation make our country and our world better. You know, we did see a reduction of all of the pollution in the world during the closures and the pandemic. We do see people helping each other. We do see people being brave in the states where it is frowned upon and wearing masks and keeping distance. And I think we need to encourage our brothers and sisters all over to do the right thing, to flatten this curve um, and to get forward with our lives so that we can continue being productive so we can continue at food banks and on our Harleys and cooking our delicious food and reading our x-rays, doing everything that we do. I think we can do it if we band together to do it. And if we understand the rationale behind the recommendations. Thank you, Rahadian. Uh, Rahadian's teaching me so much, but here's what he's taught me that this was, you've all heard the quote, especially from the movie Schindler's List, whoever saves the world, saves a life, saves the world entire. 
But the first half of that quote is, whosoever destroys one soul is though, it's as though he has destroyed the entire world, Hillel the Elder. And uh, that's a very poignant quote. And uh, it connects me to the uh, healthcare workers and so much more. Linda says, thank you for tonight's show. We'll tune in for the New York Times read along, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, and uh, she's on call. Uh, good night. Mar Fernando says, thank you for this and all the other shows. And he's tagging friends. Everybody, please do that. Before you go to bed, just tag your friends right now. Or if you're watching early in the morning somewhere in the world, we're very grateful to you for being here and for tagging your friends. I'll also show you before we end the show, uh, somebody commented about my t-shirt. And I want to tell you, we lost somebody important today. This is a photo of the great Milton Glaser, the legendary graphic designer who designed this t-shirt. It says art for life. Uh, but more importantly, he designed the I Love New York logo, which so many uh, uh, people have seen all over the world. It's an iconic, one of the greatest examples of design in history. And he, uh, I got to meet him last year, just in September. And uh, this is him at, and me at the Rubin Museum. And that's Shelley Rubin, the co-founder of the Rubin Museum. And that's him holding that T-shirt. And that's me wearing the T-shirt and wearing masks with my wonderful wife, Rupa, uh, at Rupa Online. We're in Fire Island, uh, which is an hour out of New York. And we feel like we're on lockdown here. We're able to go out, but we go just for a little bit and we're always wear a mask. And where we are, we're seeing lots of people with masks. So salute to Milton Glaser. Uh, thank you for uh, a lifetime of amazing work. He died, Sujana, on his 91st birthday. And I would say, I guess it could be that, you know, the, you get excited, there's too much excitement could be um, an, a factor, you know, this is not scientific, obviously, but it also could be that he was holding on for his 91st birthday. And I think there's something poignant and beautiful uh, about that in its own way. But of course, very sad to lose him. Twyla says, love Milton, uh, incredible understanding of emotional relationship to art and Glazer helped design the RMA and again, Fernando is, is tagging people and Rose says such wonderful pictures and I Heart New York is uh, the famous logo that he made. And uh, um, so just great to uh, see uh, to see him. Sujana, we're gonna let you go. I, I'm gonna thank the sponsors and do our other, other, um, other work, so. I just wanna say one thing that you guys taught me is you can set a reminder on your, uh, if you go on the Facebook page or the YouTube, you can hit remind and it'll remind you tomorrow morning at 11 to tune into our show. But you'll already have been tuned into the New York Times read along from 830 to 1015. So then you get a short coffee break before you come back. So thank you guys for listening tonight and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. And everyone, please follow Sujana. She is Sujana, D-R -D Sujana, uh, E-N-T, and you can easily find her on all the socials, as they say. Thank you very much, Sujana. We'll see you soon. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. See you in the morning. And uh, please follow her on Twitter, and please follow at She's On Call. And we're very proud of that show. It's one of the many adventures that we're doing at DigiMentors, and we're very grateful to her. Before we thank our sponsors, we have to do what we call a sacred uh, uh, opportunity here. We do this every night. We say their names, the names of those killed in the in in the battle with police violence and police brutality. And uh, I am um, I, I do this because on one of my shows I had the great Columbia professor, Doctor uh, uh, Doc Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who said three say their names and so my son who is our who produces the show with me uh, uh immediately found uh just started typing up a list from memory that he just started typing up and i said the names that day and i've said them every day since and we use this picture of time magazine a cover by titus kaffer and you see this picture of these young uh this this young mother and her child and then on the right you see a young mother and her child, that child, is George Floyd, and that's Larsenia Floyd, who would die two years almost to the day before her son was killed, and now they're buried next to each other. The names are Trayvon Martin, Yvette Smith, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald,
Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jerain Reed, Natasha McKenna, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, William Chapman, Sandra Bland, Darius Stewart, Samuel DuBose, Janet Wilson, Kaylin Rockmore, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Joseph Mann, Terence Crutcher, Chad Robinson, Chad Robertson, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Stefan Clark, Danny Ray Thomas, Antoine Rose, Botham Jean, Tatiana Jefferson, Michael Dean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. To that list, we must also add the name on this list of Rashard Brooks, who was killed, shot and killed in the back just two weeks ago. And we were also asked by Ryan Boudou, who was a guest on Monday, that we should say his brother's name as well. Ravi Boudou, who at the age of 32 died in police custody after being arrested on a non-violent offense. And Ryan is speaking out about his brother and wrote an article in the USA Today that you can find and see his story. Watch our episode 103, please. All our episodes are on our archives, youtube.com slash threenet. Please check them out, check out the archives. And with that, we'll say good night to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being part of this uh, family that we've, we've garnered from all over the world. We're always looking for guests, sponsors, topics. Uh, you can please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Srinet, Twitter is at Sri, and you see my the YouTube address there of the archives of all the episodes that you can find going back to episode number one, 106 episodes. Tomorrow we have a lot going on, so let's tell you. At 8.30 a.m., we start with our New York Times read-along. Professor Pavan Dingra will be with us, author of Hyper Education, Why Good Schools, Good Grades, and Good Behavior is Not Enough. That's the title of his book, uh, and uh, uh, it's about what's happening with higher ed, and we'll all learn a lot, so please check that out. Marina Korean will be with us to answer some medical questions before she hosts her show with Dr. Sujana Korean at 11 o'clock. She's on call. Please follow at She's on Call. And then at 9 o'clock Eastern, right here, is our uh, weekly positivity show on the COVID call. Yes, in the middle of all of this, we've been doing positivity shows for the last three months. Why? Because we know that we must stay positive. And even as the world is crumbling around us in so many ways, we must stay positive. We even had a humor show. Why? Because if we don't laugh, we will be crying all the time. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for all your help, all your support. We're very, very grateful. A big shout out to Milton Glazer at the age of 91. He died on his birthday yesterday, and we wish him Godspeed and good luck. Uh, we also are thinking of him and his family tonight. I met him just last September. Uh, what an inspirational, legendary graphic designer who made the I Heart New York sign, among many, many other things. Thanks very much, everybody. Comments are still coming in. And uh, Radian says, Sri, blessings to you, your team, and your respective families for all the good you do with these shows. No, thank you, Radian, for watching. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for sending this out in the world in so many ways and hitting share and tagging your friends. All of that makes a difference. And I'm so grateful for every little bit of support that everyone's been able to give us. We'll see you all, everybody, very soon. Sri at Sri.net. Email me. Bye.